And it was having a really hard time adjusting to the United States culture. And there are many ways I had trouble with it. But one of the good habits I got into when I was in Hong Kong was that I did not interrupt people when we were having conversations. And I listened more than talked. <coughs> this does sound a little weird, doesn't it? Yes. So, but I couldn't, you know, I mean, I could understand what was going on, but I could not get it out fast enough to interrupt. And it was so interesting because if we were in discussions and stuff, sometimes people would come up <coughs> with just what I was thinking, but I couldn't come up with it in Cantonese fast enough. <coughs> so when I got back from Hong Kong for quite a while, I was not jumping in and giving my two cents every time we were having a conversation, but I would listen. And I listen to other people, and sure enough, they just like in Cantonese, people would, in English could come up with the same ideas I had. But after a couple years, I too went back to business as usual, as you all know. And so I'm my talkative, interrupting, communicator, conversationalist that I still am. It just didn't stick. And it seems that for poor Peter, Seeing Jesus twice, it didn't really stick. But I think he had something else going for him, too. Or going against him, maybe. Because for Peter, here he was. You know, he had rebuked Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. He denied Jesus the night he was betrayed. I mean, this guy, he can only remember. And some of us are like that. We remember all the things we did wrong. Here come the moms and the dad. <laughs> Everything's okay now, huh? Just a little black guy. <laughs> and you say, where did you get that? Oh, I got that at church. <laughs> <laughs> and Betty one week. <laughs> black eyes the next. Okay. So we come here. So here's Peter. He's remembering what he's done wrong. And you know, he made me think all he's really good for is to go back to fishing. This fishing for men obviously wasn't that good at. And he really didn't love Jesus the way he thought he did because he denied him. And yet here is this third time Jesus shows up. And this time, well, we didn't read all of it, but Jesus made a meal for him, which I love because we have a meal today. And he made that meal for them as they were out fishing and helped them catch a lot of fish, all that kind of wild Jesus stuff that uh, they, they kind of knew about him. But then Jesus took Peter aside to talk to him. And I kind of picture the two of them around the fire after they'd eaten, you know, because Jesus made a fire to cook the fish. And I can see them, both of them, with like a stick in their hand. He'd probably done this, you know, kind of poking the fire and just sitting there talking, and I can see them doing that, and then Jesus kind of looks up and sees the other disciples that were there, and they're kind of down on, down maybe by the boat, and they're just kind of walk, walking on the beach, chit-chatting away, and he looks down there, and he says, uh, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, I notice this passage says these others. Do you love me more than these others do? But actually... All it says is, do you love me more than these? And scholars disagree. Do you love me more than these other guys do? Do you love me more than fish? Do you love me more than fishing? Well, I won't ask a lot of guys here about the fishing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but he says to Peter, do you love me more than these? And I can just see Peter. He's just kind of been going like this in the fire room. What? Oh, of course, I love you. And he's just kind of looking at you. He's like, how could you ask me that? But he kind of knows. <laughs> and then Jesus says to him, well, then, feed my lambs. And Peter goes, hmm. So they both go back to just kind of tapping the fire and kind of silent. Pretty soon, Jesus looks over at Peter again and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter looks up again. Uh, yes. You know I love you. Okay, then. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. And the third time, Jesus asks again. Don't you like that he denied Jesus three?
three times, so now he gets to say three times, I love you. So he says again, Jesus says, do you love me? And he says, this time he says, Lord. He recognizes this, who he is. He gives him that title. He says, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus tells him. I think it's kind of a wild thing that someone who has blown it as badly as Peter has, Jesus wants to make sure that he knows he's got a big job ahead of him and that Jesus is going to trust him with his mission. That is really kind of amazing. Because I think sometimes all of us might let our past have more control over us than our Lord who loves us and who we love. I think it's very likely that there are times when we need Jesus to just kind of come along and sit down and talk with us a little bit and reassure us that it doesn't matter what kind of sin is in our past, what guilt or shame or whatever it is that we think defines us. He wants to come and say, that does not define you. What really does is, do you love me? And if you do have, I got a job for you. You can go out and be part of my mission to reach this world. You are going to go out and gather others into the kingdom. Now, this doesn't mean you have to change careers. I love Brother Lawrence, some of you may have heard of him, but he was a, a monk that he would have spent time in the kitchen and he was a cook. I mean, he didn't look important to anybody. But he always could practice the presence of God. And one time he said that the way that we're sanctified, that we're made more like Christ, isn't by changing our work. But it's by doing, for God's sake, what we commonly just do for our own. That instead of just seeing something as a way to get a paycheck or to use our time or whatever, we do it for the sake of our Lord, and we do it the way he would do it. We do it with the heart and mind of Christ. So that means, and I, I worked in a lot of offices because I did temporary work, especially when I was living down in California, but I've done some up here too, but it is real easy for things to get not so nice in an office. It doesn't always get that way, but it can be pretty tough sometimes. And you can be Christ in a situation when you don't retaliate against someone. <laughs> that can really blow somebody away. If they've done something purposely against you and you don't get them back, you, you're going to throw them off. But you are showing that you are a disciple of Jesus and that you love him. And so you are going to take care of his sheep, even if they're not sure they're his yet. And it may be that whatever we're doing, we're, whoever we're around, we can get irritated. I, I know I can't, but we let the mind of Christ help us do God's will. And we want to be his disciple. And I do have, I, I found out um, that some people think that, that they're not, they can be a Christian and not be a disciple. Of Jesus, a follower of Jesus, I just want you to know that's not possible. You might be a bad disciple or a good disciple or an in-between disciple, but we're all learning, people learning from Christ. We're all people that God is at work in and giving us work to do as well. But it, again, like I said, it doesn't have to change where we are or what it is our job is. It just might change a little bit how we are and I, I remember, well, you know, because it's always this thing about the man can't yell at his boss at work, so he comes home and he kicks the dog and he screams at the kids. But disciples of Jesus don't do that. I mean, they might feel like that sometimes, but they don't do that. Because they knew, know that being a disciple means forgiving instead of demanding. They know that being a disciple means loving 
and not just being self-absorbed. Peggy and I uh, went to visit Kathleen Hollis when we were at Discovery for Home Based Communion. Now, I, a lot of you probably don't know Kathleen. She hasn't been able to get out of Discovery for a few years now, quite a few years. When I first started coming, and when I first we started doing home based communion, um, Kathleen would, she's got this huge um, motorized wheelchair. So she would bring herself down to home based communion. And then the last few years, she's had to have someone else bring her down because she couldn't really control her arms enough to really make that happen. And she, her, what she's got, it, the, the physical problem she has doesn't let her really have much control over most of her, her limbs and uh, most of her muscles. And she can't really talk much anymore. She'll move her lips so you can read her lips. And um, I mean, she's, you, you know, you might look at her and just say, now, right now, she's bedridden. Now, she may rally. She's done it before. But right now she's bedridden, and we went in, and uh, I thought, well, I'll pray for her. She looked like she's sleeping, and I don't like to wake her up, but I started praying for her out loud, and Peggy was with me, and, we, and I started praying out loud, and she turned her head and looked at us, and she, her eyes were glowing, her face was glowing, she had a smile on her face, and I thought, you know, it doesn't matter what's going on. Kathleen is a vibrant disciple of Jesus. She doesn't let anything get in the way of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I can just see those people that care for her, how much they must see Jesus in her and how she treats them. But that look of her on her face, I mean, Peggy and I were blown away. But as I thought about that, I thought, there's nothing that can keep us from being his disciple. And he wants to do that in us and through us. We keep wondering, why is God keeping Kathleen around? And I'm thinking maybe because she's one of the best models we have of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus no matter what. I've never heard her complain. I've never seen her waver from that joy of, of hearing scripture or of taking communion or being around other believers. I mean, she just exudes joy. She doesn't have to say anything to do that. And yet I know some people who would be complaining about a lot less, but not her. She is just, well, she's an amazing, vibrant, alive disciple of Jesus as she lays in that bed. And Peter, Jesus wanted Peter to know, you don't have to have, let anything get in your way either. <laughs> we don't have to let anything, we can't, don't need to let anything get in our way of being his disciple. It does mean, though, that we do keep growing, we keep learning, we keep going forward a little bit more. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next couple weeks, because I realized I, I had a whole part of the sermon that I had to get rid of because I didn't realize it was going to be too long. So guess what? You get another sermon. But uh, and this being a disciple is so important, but it can only happen if Jesus is alive. You don't follow somebody that's dead. And we're not. So I wanted us to ask, if Jesus asked, do you love me? But I'm asking as we come to the second week, after, this first Sunday after Easter, the second week of Easter as we call it, as we think about resurrection and about celebrating that resurrection every day, I want us to also say because he is alive in my life, in the life of the church, now what? Now what? Amen. Amen.